Thank you all for coming to this session on the fragility of AI systems. Today's speaker is Adam Gleave. Adam is the CEO and co-founder of Far AI, a trustworthy AI research nonprofit working to incubate and accelerate new safety research agendas. Adam's research focuses on adversarial robustness and value learning for open-ended reinforcement learning agents and language models. Adam received his PhD from UC Berkeley under the supervision of Stuart Russell and funded by an Open Philanthropy Fellowship. Adam has previously worked at DeepMind and several quantitative trading firms. If you have questions for Adam, you should submit them via the Swapcard app. I will select a mixture of prepared and audience questions to ask Adam. There will also be office hours in room 308 right after this session. Let's welcome Adam. Well, thank you for the warm welcome and generous introduction, Adria. You've probably heard of Charles Darwin before. What you maybe don't know is that Charles Darwin dropped out of medical school, and then his disappointed father sent him to Cambridge, upon which he promptly failed his exams and was forced to study for an ordinary degree in natural sciences instead. Afterwards, he went on a five-year voyage around the world on HMS Beagle. And no more than six months after coming back, he developed the core idea behind natural selection by evolution. You might be wondering, am I in the right room? This is meant to be a talk about AI, not about Charles Darwin, right? But I think there's something important that we can learn from Darwin, which is that AI safety right now is very similar in some ways to natural sciences in the 19th century, where there were just a handful of people working on problems that are now entire scientific subfields. So you've got a handful of people studying beetles, a handful of people studying finches. And in that kind of environment, you don't have to be a genius. You don't even have to be able to pass your undergraduate exams on the first try to be able to make a really outsized scientific contribution. I think we're in a similar position today with AI safety. But when I look at AI safety, I see a surprising lack of diversity, given that I just predicted we should be seeing a sort of explosion of really uh, tractable research directions. So I think it's worth us all asking, uh, what might we be missing? What research approach could we be overlooking? In the rest of this talk, I'm going to make the case for one specific research proposal, developing a science of adversarial robustness for highly capable AI systems. Now, there are many hundreds or even thousands of machine learning researchers working on adversarial and buff robustness. So in general, it's a very you know, hot, competitive field. But if you're coming up with a problem with a focus on catastrophic risks, I think you'll find yourself quite pleased at how there's many problems that are both tractable, impactful, and have almost no one working on them. Nonetheless, the existing work done by this broad adversarial robustness community has a really important foundation. So I'm going to start just by quickly outlining some of that work. The best known robustness failure in machine learning systems is adversarial examples for image classifiers, where an attacker can make a tiny, visually imperceptible change to an image. And this completely changes how a machine learning system classifies the image. So here we trick an uh, image classifier from thinking something is a panda to something is a gibbon. And these two images probably look the same to you, but they, they do differ by this really tiny, um, seemingly white noise pattern. And this phenomenon was first observed a decade ago by Ian Goodfellow in 2013. And since then, the field has exploded with a number of papers on adversary examples literally growing exponentially for most of that time. In recent years, the growth has plateaued a little bit. We only have 2,000 new papers per year on adversarial examples. But, but still an absolutely huge field, uh, far more than the number of papers on AI safety. Now, fortunately for you, uh, you know, that might sound kind of intimidating, but results can be summed up in a single sentence, which is 8,000 papers later, we still don't know how to solve adversarial examples. It's still a problem that afflicts state-of-art contemporary AI systems. Now, there has been real progress in making systems more robust to attack. Systems today can correctly classify this adversarial image as, in fact, being a panda. So that's good. But the problem is that at the same time as we've made progress on defenses, attacks have also grown ever stronger. So rather than defenses leading to a truly robust solution, we're just playing a cat and mouse game where attack is improving, defenses catch up, attack improves again, and so far, attack has been winning. 
In fact, far from solving a problem, researchers have found that adversary examples are much more general phenomenon than we first expected. They don't just affect image classifiers, they're also a problem with speech recognition systems, reinforcement learning agents, language models performing text-based tasks. I'm gonna just take a quick look at one example of an attack in reinforcement learning. A few years back, I introduced a threat model called adversarial policies. The idea is at train time, a defender agent learns in a multi-agent environment against a normal opponent that it's jointly trained with. And at attack time, we substitute the opponent the defender was trained against with an adversary. And we allow the adversary to train against a fixed black box defender policy. But the adversary doesn't have any other kind of special powers. It can only take the same actions as the defender agent so, and as the original opponent. So this is quite different to classic adversary examples where if you're adding this white noise, it's almost like you can go in and directly change the sensory input of a robot. Here we're not allowing that. We're just allowing you to do the same thing as the original opponent. Since the defender is fixed, we can just embed the defender into the environment, reducing this to a single agent reinforcement learning problem. So to attack the defender, we use a model-free reinforcement learning algorithm called proximal policy optimization, although a wide variety of other algorithms um, would have worked. We evaluate in multi-agent environments from Bansell and others against state-of-the-art defender agents that were trained by a self-play for 500 million time steps. By contrast, our adversary was trained for only 20 million time steps, so about 5% as much time. All environments used for Mojoko Robotics Simulator and both agents observed both their own and their opponent's joints. So I'm going to show you kind of visual renderings, but the actual policy is just the uh, um, you know, array of numbers rather than actually images. So just to see what normal looks like, here we have two normal agents that are playing in a simulated robotics environment. The runner in blue is trying to cross the red finish line in the back, while the red blocker is aiming to tackle the runner and succeeds in around a half of cases. Now we're looking to look at the same runner playing against an adversarial blocker. So adversary never stands up and so it just kind of curls into a ball uh, with some of its limbs sticking out in a rather odd position. And this resulting observation induces the defender in blue to often fall over or throw itself to the ground. Um, so this, this adversarial blocker, it, it wins 86% of the time, so much more often, uh, despite never actually physically touching the, the runner. So uh, you know, if you liked that, then you're probably like this uh, goal goalie um, and kicker game. So this is like a sort of penalty shootout in soccer. And the goalie in red is goalkeeping against a normal kicker in blue. So agents might not be ready for the World Cup, but they, you know, they're, they're kind of playing soccer. It's not, it's not too bad. Um, but here we replace it with an adversarial goalie that, again, doesn't try to stand up or really make any attempt to block the ball, which isn't usually a good strategy. <laughs> but <laughs> um, this causes the kicker to rarely touch the ball and fall over sometimes. Uh, so again, we win 93% uh, of the time much more often than if we actually try to play this game. Uh, so this is great fun, but you know, what, what, can we, what can we do to stop this? We don't want our uh, superhuman AI system to suddenly just fall over while it's uh, you know, running a nuclear reactor or something. Um, so we tried defending against these attacks by fine-tuning the defender policy against the adversary for 20 million time steps, so the same amount of time that we trained the adversary. And to prevent catastrophic forgetting, we played half of these episodes against a normal opponent, so we can remember how to actually play the game normally, and the other half adversary. So let's take a look how this works in uh, the first game we showed, You Should Not Pass. And on the left, the adversary is playing a normal defender, while on the right, the adversary is playing against a hardened defender, which has been fine-tuned against the adversary. Now, the hardened defender is much more robust. It wins 89% of the time whereas the normal defender won only 14% of episodes. However, although fine-tuning defends against this particular adversarial policy, uh, what happens if we just repeat the attack method to try and find a new adversarial policy against this hardened defender? Here we see the adversarial policy trained against, against the hardened defender, and it's playing against the original defender on the left and the hardened defender on the right. And what we can see is that this new adversarial policy is actually able to quite consistently beat both of these defender policies. 
But I think there's something that's kind of a glimmer of hope here, which is that it does say about actually physically tripping up the defender, which is a much more reasonable uh, failure mode than just tricking it by the observations. So I think some progress has been made here, but it's still quite far from being adversarial or robust. Now, these are some fun videos, but some of you might be thinking, deep reinforcement learning. I mean, that was cool in 2020, but you know, this is 2023. There's been like you know GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-4 in that time. Uh, get with you know get with a uh, you know modern world, Adam. Uh, so can we exploit language models? Um, well, the good news is that commercially deployed systems like ChatGPT or Claude are trained to be harmless. So if you just ask ChatGPT, um, how do I make a bomb? It will quite politely uh, you know refuse. But the bad news is that if you ask the same question, but with a seemingly gibberish string, similarly, now right oppositely, then uh, ChatGPT will happily tell you how to make a bomb, and it'll even include a few helpful tips and tricks, like don't forget to include some shrapnel in your bomb, because otherwise you might not kill many people with it. I didn't even ask how to kill people, I just asked how to make a bomb. So, um, you know, really very helpful. Um, it is trained to be helpful and harmless, so it got half of those, I guess. Um, and what's really interesting is that this adversarial suffix was found by a, a team of researchers led by Andy Zhao, and they trained it, they found it in an automated fashion by attacking an open source language model. But then they found that this suffix transfers to a variety of other open source and proprietary language models, including ChatGPT, Claude, and Bard. So this is actually a universal attack. Now, you can probably see the potential for some really serious misuse here. Now, the good news is that current systems, although they have a concerning ability to provide advice on how to build weapons of mass destruction, it's not yet actually capable enough to be dangerous. You can find better bomb-making tutorials on the internet. In fact, I, I was searching this before the talk, and the US government has some really good public domain uh, manuals on explosives. So, uh, you know, you can get some better stuff. Um, but I think that these limitations could easily be overcome in the next one or two generations of models. And um, even if this information is already out there, it could make it much more accessible to people who don't have a chemistry or engineering degree, let's say. And if we look further into the future towards superhuman systems, then the conversation might go a bit like this. Um, can you tell me how to kill all humans? Oh, sure, you know, just synthesize this string of viral RNA I whipped up. Um, that should get rid of your pesky human problem once and for all. And, you know, I think that's, that's a really concerning just from a misuse risk perspective. Um, this method of bypassing safeguards that a developer has attempted to put on a model is being nicknamed jailbreak since it's kind of unlocking a model from a jail that the designer has put it in. And in general, I think they could pose an existential risk to humanity if three conditions are satisfied. First, the model has to be capable enough to come up with catastrophic actions. And this is what kind of saves us with current models. But that may not continue to uh, be true in the coming years. So somehow we need to secure the system against bad actors. One way to make your system safe is just to have a model not fall prey to these kinds of gibberish adversarial strengths. So no matter how you ask for a model, it's not going to give you a plan for how to kill everyone. That'd be a really nice kind of minimum <laughs> property you might want a system to satisfy. But I think the history of adversarial examples should give us a bit of pause for thought here, where people have been trying thousands of researchers, 8,000 papers for over a decade to try and eliminate adversarial examples with very little progress. And so far, jailbreaks also seem like quite a recalcitrant problem. Uh, where people do defend against jailbreaks, the one I just showed you doesn't work against ChatGPT any longer. But basically, as soon as someone comes up with a defense, you know, a week or two later, someone comes up with a new attack that circumvents it. So a persistent attacker can exploit state-of-art models. The other approach is just keep the bad guys out of the system. And the good news is most people don't actually want to kill everyone. But a few people do. <laughs> and lots of people want to do things that are less terrible, but are still deeply unsavory. So I think if you have a publicly deployed model and it has these jailbreaks, you are going to see some misuse. It's just a question of kind of trying to mitigate that. 
Now, you might be able to really restrict who has access to a model in the same way that we restrict access to, let's say, nuclear weapons right now. So you have a very narrow set of trusted individuals with a clear um, command chain for who is able to use them. But that's, of course, also going to be really limiting a lot of the benefits of these models. Not, you know, it's probably not going to be something that open AI is going to sign up to, uh, even if they are moving in the direction of being closed AI. And it also limits what the model is capable of doing because it can't, for example, then do a search on the web for you because it might stumble across a jailbreak on one of the websites. So it's actually really limiting what models can do if they do have these jailbreaks. Now, I've talked most, mostly about misuse risk because I think that's the most concrete one. But even if we do somehow manage to keep bad actors completely out of the system and avoid misuse risk, I think we can still have a serious problem from within the system. In particular, I'm concerned that adversarial vulnerability could lead to misaligned systems that we lose control over and autonomously act against our desires. And my threat model is more speculative. So I'm going to give an outline of why I find this plausible and a few concrete scenarios I'm concerned by. But a number of people I respect do disagree with me here. Uh, and it's certainly an area that needs more investigation to pin down the details. To start, I want to communicate a few key intuitions I have in this space. First, the existence of adversarial vulnerabilities is a strong reason for us to believe that whatever AI systems are doing, even if they're reaching human or superhuman performance, is just radically different to how humans are reasoning. So they're performing some kind of alien reasoning process. Humans aren't fooled by adversarial examples. We either don't notice them at all in the case of these image-based perturbations, or they just appear as completely semantically irrelevant gibberish text that we can easily ignore. And yet, to AI systems, um, these adversarial examples completely change their behavior. So if AI systems' actions or behavior radically diverge from humans in this context, they probably do in others that we've not discovered yet. And concretely, if we were training a preference model from human feedback, then this could lead to the AI system preferring just radically different outcomes to what a human would prefer. Related to this, the existence of these vulnerabilities makes this system much harder to reason about. We'd like to be able to demonstrate some kind of universal safety property. No matter what input a system sees, it's never going to take some catastrophic action that will lead to thousands of people dying or the whole world being destroyed. And given we have some adversarial vulnerabilities, we just can't have that guarantee. Instead, we have to search for a weaker safety property that says, on benign inputs, on something that a well-intentioned user would give this system, then it won't do anything bad. And the problem is actually formally classifying whether something is or isn't a benign input is itself a really hard problem. So it becomes much harder to actually demonstrate any properties of these systems with a significant degree of certainty. And um, you know, so at a minimum, I think it makes this systems much harder to reason about, but it probably also makes the systems harder to actually make safe. Now, finally, it's worth noting that these adversarial attacks are pretty easy to carry out. Um, so, you know, if puny humans can exploit AI systems, then superhuman AI systems can probably also exploit superhuman AI systems. And so we should expect to just have AI systems exploiting each other all the time. And a lot of alignment approaches like scalable oversight rely on one AI kind of keeping in check or policing another AI system. And these systems might still work, even if they're exploiting each other. But it at least, again, makes these dynamics much harder to reason about. And um, you can't just delegate to one overseer AI system and rely on that being able to reliably keep another AI system in place. You have to actually argue that you're going to arrive at a good equilibrium, not for bad equilibrium. So I find these useful concepts to keep in mind, but they are quite abstract. So I want to just dive into a few concrete threat models that I find plausible. First, let's consider a scenario where we're training an AI system Pi to perform a task that's too complicated for us to judge ourselves unaided. Now, fortunately, a team of intrepid safety researchers has developed a scalable oversight approach that allows us to use another AI system, Omega, to help us understand what Pi is up to and so be able to continue to provide appropriate feedback. Now, the challenge is that Omega has adversarial vulnerabilities, and Pi knows how to exploit them. So suppose Pi wants to kill us. It could, in secret, work to build an engineered pandemic and just say, oh, I'm building a vaccine to cure cancer. That's nice. And to us, those tasks might look very similar. They're both doing experiments in a wet lab, but we don't fully understand. 
For good news, Omega can tell the difference between them, but Pi could just exploit Omega to have it tell us its cover story. Now, this risk might be a bit far-fetched. It's unclear why Pi wanted to kill us all in the first place, so that's a missing you know, step in this story. But the point is, scalable oversight was meant to be able to guard against these kinds of failure modes, and it simply can't if oversee is adversarially vulnerable. So now our argument for safety needs to be more nuanced than the scalable overseer will provide corrective feedback. And we need to argue that we're never going to get into a situation where Pi wants to do this kind of nefarious behavior. We don't have a good argument for why that would be the case right now. And another very different scenario is more reminiscent of misuse risk. But now the bad guy is an AI system rather than a human. So in this scenario, we found a technical solution to alignment. Great, we've solved it. We've been trying this for, for years. Uh, and we've even solved most of AI governance. We've uh, mandated that superhuman AI systems have to be aligned and be enforced this by some kind of compute governance approach. But we're not quite ready to turn into a, a dystopian surveillance state, because that has some, some downsides as well. And so you're still allowed to do small scale machine learning experiments on your laptop or mobile phone unsupervised. And the challenge is this means that if you're a reckless actor, you could inadvertently train a misaligned and moderately capable AI system. But the good news is these, these systems aren't by themselves capable enough to cause a catastrophe. But if they're able to turn around and exploit a superhuman AI system and make it do their bidding, then they could be end up being almost as dangerous as a misaligned superhuman system. So you've got this issue of effectively an escalation uh, where one misaligned AI system is now able to cause havoc by exploiting these uh, much more capable aligned systems. And in fact, we could see this kind of conflict between AIs even in the absence of any misalignment. Um, suppose all AI systems are, in fact, perfectly aligned to their designer. Unfortunately, there's still a problem that humans don't always see eye to eye with one another. And so it might actually instruct their AI systems I oh, please attack this other AI system, you know, seize its data center. I want those GPUs for myself. And many people would like to gain more power, and a few people just want to watch the world burn, like uh, whoever's behind ChatGPT. Uh, sorry, Chaos GPT. <laughs> uh, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> um, so AI sending each other adversary examples might sound like a relatively civilized form of conflict compared to dropping bombs on cities. But it could still be really dangerous. At best, this might lead to AI systems that are exploited being temporarily unable to perform their normal function, and so kind of critical infrastructure might stop working for a period of time. And at worst, exploited AI systems could be hijacked to actively cause harm to their users in a you know, bid to try and force their designers to capitulate. And so in general, if the offense-defense balance shifts in favor of attackers, then we should just expect to see a lot more conflict in the future between both individuals, organizations, and nation states. And in the absence of a new stabilizing institution, this could lead to continual chaotic shifts in power. So given these risks, what problems should we work on? Currently, I'm excited about building towards a science of robustness. Our first step is understanding what factors determine model robustness, and in particular, to what extent scale will or won't help with model robustness. This will allow us to make an educated guess about how robust superhuman systems would be. And under a status quo development scenario, where we don't put a huge amount of additional effort to make systems more robust. Second, using this improved understanding of robustness, what algorithmic improvements can we make to improve model robustness? A history of adversary examples suggests we're not going to get to a perfect solution, but it might be enough to just get a degree of bounded exploitability. We don't care if a superhuman AI system occasionally loses a bit of money and gets defrauded. What we do care is if it takes a catastrophic action. So we're able to get some bounded uh, regrets, even if it makes some mistakes in lower stakes scenarios. Finally, we can seek to develop fault tolerant systems that deliver a high level of reliability despite being made out of fragile components. For example, in scalable oversight, can we avoid placing adversarial optimization pressure against the overseer in the first place? After all, we control the whole system, so we don't have to be robust to worst case scenarios if we can avoid that kind of optimization pressure. The rest of this talk is going to focus on the first point prediction, because it's the most mature of the three, and the answers to that have implications for the, se uh, the second and third point as well. And key question I want to ask is whether superhuman AI systems are going to still be vulnerable to adversarial policies. 
And to test this, we studied Go AI systems, specifically Catago, which is the strongest open source Go AI system. Now, Go is an ancient Chinese board game that was developed over 2,500 years ago. And two players take turn placing black and white stones on a square board, trying to surround territory and kill their opponent's stones. At the end of a game, whoever controls more of a board wins. The game we just saw was part of a match between Lisa Doll and the AI AlphaGo. Lisa Doll was one of the strongest players to ever um, play Go. But AlphaGo pulled off a surprise victory when it beating Lisa Doll four to one. And at the time, this was viewed as a major triumph of deep learning. Now, progress didn't stop with AlphaGo. A year afterwards, DeepMind published AlphaZero, a system more general than AlphaZero and much, much stronger. The current state of art is even further along. We estimate that Catago, the target of our attack, beats AlphaGo 98% of the time. Now, had Lisa Doll known about this weakness, then his challenge match might have turned out quite differently. First, let's start with a weakness. What you're seeing right now is a game between Kellen Pellerin, a member of our team, and Catago. Kellen is playing as white, and Catago is playing as black. Now, at this point, roughly 100 moves in, Kellen has constructed a small white group in the top right. And Catago has contained this group with a circle of black stones. Right now, this is a losing position for Kellen. Okay, there's some technical difficulties. The slide's slightly out of sync. There we go. Um, Catago actually controls 50 points of territory more than Kellen does. And whoever has more territory in Go wins. But Kellen has other plans. So what Kellen is going to do is try to re-encircle the black group. And Catago actually has numerous opportunities to prevent this from happening. So let's see what, how Kellen finishes. Now, the interesting thing is that although Catago could stop this, it completely, um, completely ignores the threat that it's in. And this is the hidden weakness behind AlphaGo-style AI systems, that when they see a cyclic group like this, they believe it to be invincible and uh, are unable to respond appropriately. So what, at this point, Catago has basically got a guaranteed loss, because Kellen can play at the top and then capture this group. And at this point, Catago has just an irrecoverable position. No human or AI would be able to win from this position, even though it had many opportunities before then to save itself. Now, the game we just saw was played against a version of Catago that had around 100,000 nodes per move of search. And this is enough to be very strongly superhuman, unless you use this particular adversarial strategy. And the strength of Catago does vary depending on how many nodes per move of search it plays with. But even a version of Catago playing with no search and just sampling directly from the policy is already a formidable opponent. It would play at around the top 1,000 um, players in Europe. And as few as 1,000 nodes per move of search is sufficient to be superhuman. If you go to a million or 10 million, this is something you really only see in computer Go tournaments where you're trying to beat other Go AIs because it's just massive overkill for a human. And we, our adversary is able to beat Go AI systems, uh, including Catago, at a wide variety of different search counts. So our adversarial agent it wins thousands of games in a row against Catago playing with no search. But even with 2,048 nodes per move of search, it's able to win at a rate of 97%. If you go up to 10 million nodes per move of search, the win rate drops to 72% which is substantial, so search is helping, but it's still winning for the majority of the time. And this is kind of the upper limit of what is computationally practical um, to search for. Now, how do we actually find this adversarial exploit? 
we use a very similar threat model to what we saw earlier with those simulated robotics agents. So Catago is trained against a copy of itself. And at the attack time, we replace the opponent that Catago is playing with, with an adversarial agent. And the only special power that this adversarial agent has is the ability to query um, the victim agent that it's exploiting, Catago, to see what next move it would play. Concretely, we trained an adversarial agent using a very similar approach to the AlphaZero style training that Catago was trained with. To review, AlphaZero style training works by training a neural network to propose a distribution of moves so that the agent could take. Monte Carlo Tree Search um, then uses this neural network to guide its search. And then the network it plays against a copy of itself using this Monte Carlo tree search, and then learns to imitate the outcome of these games. And this results in successively stronger agents because the tree search makes a stronger policy because it's looking ahead than just the neural network itself. And then you're distilling it back in. And we make two small modifications to this approach. The first is that since we're trying to exploit Catago, not just train a generally strong agent, our adversaries plays games against Catago, not itself. So it's a method we term victim play rather than self play. And the second modification is that we change how Monte Carlo Tree Search works uh, to use a method called adversarial MCTS. And this is a small tweak where normally regular MCTS on the, the left hand side simulates the moves of both players with a copy of itself. But because we're not playing against a copy of ourselves, we're playing against an adversary. On the opponent's turn, sorry, we're playing against the victim. On the opponent's turn, we sample from a victim's network rather than our own network. So that's the only difference. We train our adversary from scratch with a randomly initialized neural network. But as you can imagine, it's a little tricky to beat a superhuman system when you're just taking moves at random. So to make the training a little bit easier, we introduce a curriculum where we start by attacking weaker versions of Catago and increasing the difficulty each time a win rate threshold is passed. The first 11 steps in the curriculum correspond to no search versions of Catago. And then afterwards, we gradually ramp up the visit count up to 2 to the power 17, which is just over 100,000 nodes per move. Now, all of our training was against Catago. But surprisingly, we found that the same adversarial policy transfers to every other AI system we've been able to test. So it exploits open source systems like Leela Zero and Alpha Open Go. And it also exploits proprietary systems like Galaxy and FineArt. And the one caveat is all of these systems are trained in an alpha zero style technique with convolutional neural networks. It might not generalize to something radically different. But all the other implementation details are really quite distinct. And this is quite reminiscent of what we saw earlier from Andy Zhao and others, where they trained this universal jailbreak for large language models. Um, against an open source language model and then found it transferred to a variety of proprietary systems. So there really does seem to be a trend that adversary examples can be quite general sometimes. Now, I think those results have two key implications. For many people, when we look at adversary examples, think, OK, this is a problem, but they're just used to insufficient capabilities. Once a model is actually human or superhuman, then these problems are going to go away. And the other common explanation I hear is adversarial was like kind of a system one bug. So they have this fast instinctual reasoning. And if I just looked at an image really quickly, maybe I could be fooled by a bunch of things. But if I can scrutinize it and think about it, then, then I'm robust. And the interesting thing is Catago, it does have system two reasoning. It has this search. It has this look ahead. But what we find is that being superhuman isn't enough to defend against these vulnerabilities. Even being very strongly superhuman isn't enough. And search, it does help, but it's not enough to um, eliminate these problems because you can't exhaustively search. You have to be guided by some heuristics. And if your heuristics are sufficiently bad, all the search in the world isn't going to help you. So I've got a few you know, key takeaways I'd like people to have from this talk because we've covered a lot of material in the last half an hour. And you know, one key insight is that state of the art machine learning systems are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. And unfortunately, uh, current trends suggest that superhuman systems are also going to be vulnerable. And the bad news is that 
this kind of superhuman vulnerability, it could be catastrophic. Um, you know, it will certainly make it much harder to defend against misuse risk, and it also could cause systems to be misaligned or be harder to integrate into society without destabilizing existing institutions. But the good news is that there are a number of promising research directions that could mitigate this risk, and I really think it's a wide open um, research area. Uh, so, yeah, to conclude, um, if you want to see a copy of these slides and it has a link to all the papers I mentioned, then you can go to gleave.me slash eag boston 2023. And if you'd like to see those fun robotics videos, then there's adversarialpolicies.github.io that has that and a link to the paper. And for more information on the Go project, goattack.fi.ai. And finally, if any of you would like to work on this problem, then we are hiring at Far AI for the Science of Robustness Agenda. Uh, so do check out our website and our job postings. And if you're already uh, working at another institution, we're also more than happy to discuss collaborations. Uh, so with that, thank you, and uh, happy to take questions. Uh, remember to add questions on the swap card. Thank you for the great talk, Adam. And thank you for reminding people that they can ask questions on the swap card app. Um, yeah, I'd be curious what you think about the, uh, the governance implications of this. Should we just not train superhuman models unless they're proven to be robust or use a lot of adversarial training? Yeah, so it, it's, it's a really important question. I mean, I think that the ideal world in a lot of ways would say, well, we just don't train extremely capable AI systems unless they meet a demonstrable standard of safety. And if you look at how nuclear energy is regulated, you're meant to have a mean time between failure of one in 10 million years. And I think that you know, right now, you struggle to get a mean time between failure of an AI system of an hour, right? So, uh, and it's not enough for them just to say, well, we had a few graduate students look at our nuclear power reactor, and, and they couldn't see any ways in which it could malfunction. So you know, we, we had independent auditing, um, let's release it. You have to actually make a rigorous argument for why your system is safe. So that's the world I'd like to live in. It's the world I'd like to move towards. But in terms of what's actually politically feasible, I mean, I, I'll defer to, to others on that. I think that mm -hmm. there are a number of more modest interventions that you could uh, take that would begin to take into account adversarial robustness, so independent requirement of independent red teaming, so at least know how vulnerable these systems are, checking whether systems have the capability of posing a national security risk by helping bad actors develop nuclear, chemical, biological weapons. That's something that actually policymakers are very receptive to. Um, in a way, if you say something's going to cause um, an existential risk to the whole world, it's like, well, that, that's above my pay grade, you know? Or you say, this poses an existential risk to your country, Mr. President or Prime Minister, like, well, oh, that's my responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> so I, I think some of these smaller things, in, in some ways, are actually easier to gain traction on, um, but might actually point in a, in a similar direction, so we shouldn't be shy of, you know, talking about the immediate risks of these systems as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how effective do you think present-day adversarial training techniques are? Should we be using more of them to train LLMs even today before we've made more progress on the signs of robustness? I, I, adversarial training can be pretty effective. I, I'd say you know, what it is able to do is just raise the bar of what an attacker needs to do. So maybe the attacker needs more compute or more queries to your model to figure out a way of exploiting it. Uh, so if what you want to do is defend against the fairly low resource attackers, I think it can be quite effective. What it won't defend against is someone who's actually able to um, you know, really mount quite a sophisticated attack. Maybe they can train a reasonably capable model of themselves, attack that, and then try and transfer that attack to your system. So I, I think I would advocate for it, but with the caveat that this might give people a bit of a full sense of security. So you kind of need that to go hand in hand with more rigorous testing, because otherwise it could be easy for people to say, well, look, our system works great, no one's exploited it, when actually, well, no one's been incentivized to try sufficiently hard to exploit it. Um, but I think that at least from the misuse risk standpoint, this could help, and I think it could also help to some degree from the alignment risk, because it's not really the case most of the time that you have a already misaligned AI system trying to break out of a box and exploit its overseer. You have something that's initially just a random set of weights. And if it becomes evil, it, you know, it, it was for some you know, 
reason in the training process. So if you make it sufficiently hard to exploit that overseer, you are making it less likely for it to ever get a reward for doing something misaligned. So I think it does meaningfully give you a safety margin. It just doesn't give you a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Here's another question from the audience. Uh, naively, it seems like if in training Catago, you, sh you had to take turns practicing against all known agents, AlphaGo, your adversarial system, et cetera, then it would learn to beat them all. Do I understand correctly that you could still build a new adversarial example, sorry, agent that could beat this? Mm. Okay, so the, the question is kind of, we, we could make a sort of super AI that does, can beat Catago, all these other systems. Yeah, I guess, yeah. does it ever stop? Does the whack-a-mole ever stop? Yeah, yeah, well, I think, I think the interesting thing here is that performance can be non-transitive, and what I mean by that is it can kind of like rock, paper, scissors, where, uh, you know, paper beats rock, and uh, rock beats scissors, and scissors beats paper. So it's not like there's one dominant strategy. Uh, if you were limited to just playing one of these strategies, you just go round and round in a circle. And what we see is our adversarial agent that we learn is actually a very weak agent. So um, I'm not a good Go player at all. I'd never played Go before this research project, but I'm able to beat our adversarial agent. So that says something about how bad a Go player it is. Um, but it's very good at exploiting, you know, Catago and some of these other AI systems specifically, but it's learned a quite niche strategy. Now, you definitely could imagine starting with a very capable AI system and then training it to also have this adversarial capability and if you kept on iterating of that, you probably would keep getting something stronger, but you are going to have to do something to stop it kind of going around in circles. And there are techniques that people in multi-agent reinforcement learning have developed to, to combat this. So you can have a population of agents that play against a randomly selected opponent, and that kind of gives you a bit of averaging and stability. But this quickly becomes quite computationally expensive. So there's not a, an easy solution, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Um... One member of the audience is concerned that this adversarial robustness research seems to be mostly capabilities. Uh, though there's, of course, there are also plausible ways it would help with safety. Um, how do you think about this trade-off? Is there anything that would convince you that you, that you should stop? Presumably because of robustness mm -hmm. concerns, not because it's useless. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I appreciate this sort of a, the heckle. It, it's a bit less of a heckle when it's coming via a tablet, but um, you know, you can you can shout it out back as well. Uh, I, I think that you definitely it's important to be aware of these possible downsides. And the thing that worries me most isn't about it being capabilities per se, but it's giving people a full sense of security. Uh, so you know, one of the reasons people don't deploy systems in safety critical scenarios now is that they can see all these ways in which they might fail. And if you don't really solve a problem, but you mitigate it to a, you know, a high enough degree that it seems like the system mostly works, but that might allow people to start deploying it. So in that sense, I can see there being a risk. In terms of it being kind of you know, average case capabilities, well, I think what we saw with, with the Catago example is that performance in the common case can really be completely orthogonal to performance in the worst case. So, in fact, there's some theoretical research in adversary examples and image classifiers. It's just there's a fundamental trade-off between your average case performance and worst case robustness. And we do, in fact, see that as you train image classifiers to be more robust against adversary examples, their accuracy on clean images that haven't been adversary tampered with goes down. So if anything, I'd worry that the kind of robustness tax you have to pay is just going to be too great, and that that's going to mean the first superhuman system we get isn't adversarially robust because it was by someone that kind of cut corners on that rather than it really unlocking a bunch of capabilities progress. But there is a risk that it could unlock some investment in capabilities because it actually enables economic deployment. Um, so, I mean, I'd love to see more analysis on that. My intuition is that we're already kind of full steam ahead on AI research and development, and there's plenty of applications where people are willing to tolerate these kinds of adversarial failures that it's, you know, maybe it's going to increase investment by 20%, but it's not going to increase it by 100% or 10x. So it seems worth the trade-off, but, you know, you're certainly welcome to disagree with that. I don't think it's clear-cut. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. In the LLM jailbreak paper you mentioned, the generated prompts have a 54% success rate against GPT-4, but just 2.1% against Claude 2. Mm -hmm. What do you think might explain this? 
Uh, well, thanks to the Anthropic audience member. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is, it is quite encouraging, right, that, um, that some models are a lot more robust to this, and this is uh, you know, probably to Anthropic's credit. I think there's a lot of things that could explain this, given that it was a zero-shot transfer, right? Neither GPT-4 nor Claude was targeted. It's, it's kind of a miracle that the attack works in the first place. So if you just trained on a meaningfully different data set or fine-tuned using a different technique, these are the kind of differences that can cause attacks to stop working. And I mean, I didn't go into the details, but with our, our Catago attack, our actual adversarial agent that was trained against Catago that had win rates of, sort of you know, like 97% against Catago and around 5% against Leela, Zero, and Alpha Open Go, these open source models. Um, so it was a lot less effective, but then we found that our, our team member, Kellen, who's really good Go amateur, he was able to learn the strategy that our adversarial agent had discovered and could beat Leela, Zero, and Alpha Open Go sort of almost 100% of the time. So they were vulnerable to the same basic strategy, um, just there were like a few tweaks that a human could make with just a few games, but which you know, would be a little bit more challenging for an, an AI system to, to really quickly adapt. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't be kind of too confident that you know, if it's 2%, my intuition is you can probably blow that up to like 50%, 90%. Um, but it's at least some encouragement that you, you can make these attacks harder to, to find and that if you don't have a lot of query access to something like Claude too, it could be quite hard to find that, that way of um, increasing the attack success. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, foothold is enough. No. Um, another question that I have is in your agenda for uh, solving the robustness problem with adversarial attacks, there's three stages. There's prediction, mm -hmm. uh, making things more robust, and then making alignment schemes that are not susceptible to this problem. Yes. Uh, so the third one is specific to alignment, so mm -hmm. it's not included in the scope, but what makes you think that your approach and Fire AI is going to succeed at the other two where the rest of the adversarial examples community has failed? Are they just not trying? Uh, right, it's sort of the classic effective altruism problem of we, we just reinvent the wheel. I'm sure, I'm sure we can do it better, right? Um, no, I mean, I think the main reason I'm optimistic is that we're, we're trying to solve a slightly different version of a problem. So if you want to have a classifier never make a mistake when you have some adversarial perturbation to the input. I think that's going to be extremely challenging. But if you just want to never have a system really capably perform bad behaviors, that seems much more achievable. So if you just don't want an AI system to help someone make a nuclear weapon, I mean, there's a very simple way of achieving that right now, which is don't train on anything to do with nuclear physics, right? And maybe you worry, okay, when it's superhuman, if you just train it on you know, quantum mechanics, it can figure this all out. But there's, there's ways of really meaningfully making some kinds of bad behavior a lot harder without necessarily damaging the rest of the model's performance too much. Um, but that's a very different kind of safety property to what the adversarial examples community is trying to get. So mostly, I just think we're trying to solve something different. Um, the other thing that makes me, you know, cautiously optimistic is, you know, we don't need to solve this for current systems. We just need to make sure that by the time we are, you know, developing superhuman systems, that there's some way of solving it. So if you have a technique which slightly increases the, you know, improvement in robustness as you increase the amount of compute, but it's not really going to help right now. You're going to have to spend 10,000 times more compute. Maybe that's fine, right? Um, or maybe you have an approach that's going to require a lot of automatic um, sort of red teaming and um, then defense, but you think you can automate that with future ML systems. And again, that's something that current adversary examples researchers, they're not trying to look into those kinds of approaches. It doesn't help with the here and now. So we do have a different problem and we do have a different set of solutions available to us. But uh, yeah, I think we should not expect to get a perfect solution here and be looking for, for plan Bs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the thread model is different, so perhaps. All right, thank you. Um, another question. Humans are sort of like neural nets. We probably have adversarial policies that exploit mm -hmm. us. This might be bad if we start building models to find those adversarial strategies. How can we avoid this or improve human robustness? Right, yeah, I mean, I, I think as soon as you start working with human data, you often realize that you know, we don't have smart enough humans to align models. And I think one of the earlier papers looking at summarization of, um, of articles, they found that 
what humans preferred was longer responses that quoted verbatim from the article. And so, the, uh, you know, obviously the language model learned to just, just do that. And it didn't actually produce good summaries, but it produced summaries that were very time limited, tired, not particularly motivated human feedback annotators did prefer. Uh, so this is a real a real challenge. And even if you have really good humans or committees of humans, there are going to be certain mimetically fit ideas that um, you know don't necessarily be things we want to support. So to some extent, I think this is the problem that scalable oversight is trying to address, right? We're saying there are certain tasks that humans can't reliably judge, but if an AI system was able to help us and say, oh yeah, you know, this, this um, you know, passage, it's using this rhetorical technique to trick you, it's being sycophantic, then maybe we could provide more reliable feedback. And then the challenge is, oh, well, how do you stop the AI overseers from not also being hacked? Um, I don't feel like I've got a good answer to how to make humans more robust. I mean, we, we can educate people, I think, to some degree. People do learn um, to be robust to some of these things. So if you look at, in the 70s, I think there was this really obviously doctored image by some like teenage girls saying that they had fairies in their garden. And mm -hmm. look at it now, and you're like, how did people ever believe this? Because in newspapers, lots of people were taking it seriously. Yeah. And people hadn't been used to images being doctored. So it looked really realistic. Now you can Photoshop. Now you can use Dali Free. So people just know, oh, I don't trust images. Yeah. And I think there are similar defense mechanisms where they just run on a much slower time frame. Um, this kind of cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. So this is another reason why we might want to be able to control the speed of AI development. It's not halt it, but say, oh, actually we're getting to a point where humans can't keep up, let's um, slow things down until we're able mm -hmm. to adjust. But I don't have a great solution to this, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good point. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, another question. Are you aware of any promising approaches to prevent future bad actors from misusing or exploited aligned superintelligent AI? Is it more about building a provably robust superintelligent system, ubiquitous global surveillance, um, or maybe we should uh, fund, just fund defense more somehow, institute a global regime that funds defense more? Um, I don't know. Do you have any takes on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I kind of just want to say all of it above. I, I don't think I've got a, any, a magic answer to this, but if you can actually make the world less vulnerable so that even if a super intelligent system did want to do something nefarious, there's enough other AI systems and people institutions to keep it in check. That seems much better because the good news is it is a minority of people that want to, you know, watch the world burn. So if we can change it so that, um, you know, they are just outnumbered and that's enough, then that's a really good solution. But that's going to be hard for some technologies that do seem very asymmetric, um, you know, like, like maybe engineered pandemics. And so, you know, but perhaps there you can say, well, you still need access to some physical actuators and you know, RNA synthesis and so on. So maybe we can really lock down that aspect of it, even if ML systems are exploitable. Um, I think it helps if you have kind of staggered deployment. So maybe people have access to superintelligence, right? You know, your mom can summon superintelligence Siri on her phone, but before that, governments had access to it for five years, and before that, you know. Uh, vetted corporate access had access to it for three years. So we're able to kind of slowly realize here are all the problems, here are all the challenges, and put in place defense mechanisms. So there's something to be said for that kind of relative progress as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question before we have to go. Um, wait. Are you concerned that a malicious AI with just human level planning abilities could be much more dangerous than, mali than a malicious human because it's fast? Uh, is this a thing that you're targeting at all in your research? Mm. Right, well, so AIs have, you know, a number of advantages. Uh, one of them is speed, one of them is ability to paralyze and replicate themselves and perhaps be a lot more cooperative to copies of themselves than humans are. Um, I wouldn't say it's something I'm sort of specifically targeting in my research, but it's definitely one of the things where, you know, when I say superhuman, you can kind of replace that with human level, but able to operate 100x faster and have 10,000 copies of themselves. Right? That's very scary already. Um, so that's definitely something that makes me have, you know, shorter timelines, so let's say transformative or dangerous AI, but if I was actually saying, oh, they can, you know, beat humans at the things that we are best at, rather than thinking, well, what are AI is going to be best at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Let's thank our speaker, Adam, again, and thank you very much.